Hare Krishna devotees, please accept my humble obeisances of Lord Shri Prabhupada. Welcome devotees to morning Bhagavatam class. This morning we will be discussing and covering chapter uh, Shrimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 9, and the last verse of this chapter, verse 49. And the chapter is entitled The Passing of Bhishma Dev in the Presence of Lord Krishna. And the class will begin by His Holiness Chandramali Swami. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisance as all glories to you on all good Prabhupada. Hare Krishna, my obeisances to you and to all the devotees. Hare Krishna, we are here in Govardhan Echo Village. Hare Vol. In India. So we will try to. Um, so I should mention something that this is India, and you know what internet is like in India, <laughs> which is not very favorable to what we're doing. <laughs> And yesterday I got shut down completely. So. Oh, Krishna. Let's, let's hope it doesn't happen again. We will pray for that, Marza. It does not happen. Well, I gave my class yesterday, and then as soon as the question started, everything just, just collapsed. And oh, that was it. That was the end of it. So, Okay, so we'll begin by your mercy. Srimad Bhagavatam 1949. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Itra Chanu Mato Rajaham Vasudevanu Moditaha. Chakara Rajam Bhamuna Itrir Patamaham Vigahu Translation After this, the great religious king Maharaj Yudhisthira executed the royal power in the kingdom strictly according to the codes of royal principles approved by his uncle and confirmed by Lord Sri Krishna. Srila Prabhupada's purport. Maharaj Yudhisthira was not a mere tax collector. He was always conscious of his duty as a king, which is no less than a father or a spiritual master. The king is to see to the welfare of the citizens from all angles of social, political, economical, and spiritual upliftment. The king must know that human life is meant for liberating the encaged soul from the bondage of material conditions. And therefore his duty is to see that the citizens are promptly looked after to attain this highest stage of perfection. Maharaj Yudhisthira followed these principles strictly as will be seen from the next chapter. And not only did he follow the principles, but he also got approval from his old uncle who was experienced in political affairs. And that was also confirmed by Lord Krishna, the speaker of the philosophy of Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> Maharaj Yudhisthira is the ideal monarch and monarchy under a trained king like Maharaj Yudhisthira is by far the most superior form of government, superior to modern republics or governments of the people by the people. The mass of people, especially in this age of Kali, are all born sutras, basically low-born, ill-trained, unfortunate, and badly associated. They themselves do not know the highest perfectional aim of life. Therefore, votes cast by them actually have no value, and thus persons elected by such irresponsible votes cannot be responsible representatives like Maharaj Yudhisthira. Thus ends the Bhaktivedanta purports of the first canto, ninth chapter of Srimad Bhagavatam entitled The Passing Away of Bhishma Dev in the Presence of Lord Krishna. Om Agyan Timirandasya Gananjana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasma Shri Gurave Maha 
Nama Om Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Kristaya Bhutale, Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swamini Kinamane, Namaste <coughs> Saraswati Deve, Gauravani Pacharine Nirvase, Sasunyavari, Asyatya De Sukarine, Sri Vanchakalpa, Dhru Bhischa, Kripa Sindhu Bhavacha, Titanam, Avane Bhyo, Vaishnava Bhyo, Maho Namaha, Jai Sri Krishna, Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadadara Sivasa Vigor Bhaktivinam, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So, in a very succinct uh, explanation, Srila Prabhupada has given us um, the duties and responsibilities and the type of government that is ideal to rule over the citizens of a particular country, particular state. In the same explanations, he's also shown us the default in today's modern governments, a default that is symptomatic of the age. <laughs> Here, yeah, Kalo Sudra Sambhavan, it's mentioned that in this age, all people are born basically in the category of Sudras, even though one may be born in a Brahmin family, Kshatriya family, or Raisha family, if they do not receive training and education accordingly, then, and perform the activities of these different varnas, they are considered to be in the category of sudras, which means those who really don't, cannot maintain themselves and depend on working for others. Um, of course, sudras working for sudras, you have a very upside down uh, situation where there is no leadership. And today's uh, so-called modern world, the governments are not only uh, not responsible to represent the population, nor provide in general what the population needs, but we also see that uh, they are also influenced by other as sectors of society that are very powerful and very avaricious. So we have today's uh, society is nowhere near, and as Prabhupada says, the ideal monarch of Maharaj Judas there and the government that supports that type of ide uh, ideal rule. So we live in a very, uh, what we say, uh, dysfunctional, and that's, a, that's a nice word. Actually, it's more like, as it says that in the uh, Mahabharata, that the leaders, the rulers in Kali Yuga will no be better than dacoits, thieves, rogues, and uh, the persons who are only interested in gaining power, position, wealth, and uh, are exploiting the people. So therefore, nobody likes the leaders nowadays. They elect the leaders, then they throw them out. And then they elect someone else and they do the same thing. The leaders can't represent the people. The leaders are put into power by powerful organizations, corporations, and various other, other influential and very wealthy groups who have vested interest in getting uh, situations for their own aggrandizement, their own greed. And therefore, you know, there is, there is no real government nowadays and people are rejecting government. Um, people don't follow government. And those who follow it are always being exploited. They may dole down a, a few, a few uh, little trinkets of uh, they build some roads, or they may uh, give some welfare checks every once in a while. <laughs> it says here, Maharaj Judas there was not a mere tax collector, simply collecting taxes. So here we see what is the ideal principle. And this is in line with Krishna, as it says here also, because Krishna is the one 
who sets up according to the Manu Samhita, which is the explanation of Krishna's rule of how leadership in society it has to also include the welfare of people in their spiritual upliftment. And Srila Prabhupada says, it's the duty of the leader of society to make sure that everyone is following religious principles. He doesn't say they have to be a particular type of religious principles, but authorize religious principles according to the traditions that people choose to follow, which have to be within the category of bona fide. So what that, does that mean that if you're a Christian, be a good Christian. If you're, uh, if you're a Muslim, follow that tradition properly. Whatever particular uh, alignment you've made in society according to your religious choice, then one should follow that. And it's up to the government leadership to make sure that there are people are following following them so it takes it takes on this responsible because here it says that the king is more like uh, no less than the father or a spiritual master as it says that um, um, there are seven mothers <laughs> seven mothers so one of the mothers that is listed in these seven is the wife of the king or the wife of the monarch, wife of the president. He, that lady, they call it, sometimes they call it first lady, is in the category of being a mother. So therefore, the king is also like a father. So the father and the mother uh, have to see to the welfare of the citizens in all aspects, social, political, economic, spirit, just like a father and mother in a family, but also be concerned that their children are getting everything they need to grow up nicely, healthy, get the education they need and practice their spiritual activities. So we see how important it is. And therefore we see in today's society, leaders don't last so long. They come in for a few years, and then they're kicked out again and somebody else comes in and follows the same rotation. And if they somehow come in under a, a totalitarian government, they rule by military and anyone who goes against them is uh, punished. So, um, yeah. But here, uh, it's, also, it's also, again, referring back that that uh, if there is deviations to a person who comes, just like it says that in the modern Samhita, the king, the leader, the president, gets one-sixth of the karma of the population they rule over. That means if the population are pious and religious, they get, get one-sixth of that to their own credit. And if it's the opposite, if it's sinful or you know, sinful or uh, you know, degraded activities, then they also get one sixth of that. So you see, to now today's leaders, they come, they go, they get assassinated, they get uh, they get voted in, they get voted out. It's uh, when we look at the history of. Uh, of Vedic culture, we see throughout the world that sometimes kings would rule 50, 60, hundreds of years. Maharaj Bhart, who was the king of the whole world at one time, he ruled for many, many, many decades or even more. And then we have many other great kings such as Maharaj Prithu, uh, Maharaj Parikshit, ruling the world for for many, many years, because they were loved by them, the citizens and the citizens um, also um, supported them in so many different ways. And the kings were always, as it says here, and this is not just some exaggeration or some nice way to explain things. They are like the father or the spiritual master, actually both. 
And so when people have that kind of leadership, then people are happy. So today, Prabhupada says, today people are suffering because of bad leadership. <laughs> um, they had they elected persons who were not qualified, and therefore they are also getting the results of that. And Prabhupada goes also on to say that these same people come from the same category of the people who are voting them in. Therefore, what can you expect? You know, if you have a bunch of persons who are not trained or simply on the platform of eating, sleeping, mating, and defending, who simply look for sense gratification as the benefit of life, then it's no better than an animal society. And therefore, if one animal elects another animal, what do you have? You have just, you know, the, the animal farm. Uh, therefore, there is always fight. There's always problems. But here we find Maharaj Yudhisthira. He's, um, he was trained and he also received uh, knowledge both from Bhishma Dev, who was also a monarch in the sense that he was qualified, although he never took the position. He was born in a very royal family, and his father was one of the ideal kings, King Santanu. And he knew how to rule. In fact, he taught Maharaj Yudhisthira these principles, how to rule the government. It's interesting. I should mention that His Holiness Bhakti Tirtha Swami Maharaj wrote two books called Leadership One, and leadership too. And leadership too, a lot of it, most of it, in fact, is in, includes the teachings that Bhishma Dev gave to Maharaj Yudhisthira on what is the responsibility of a leader in, in, in the state, in society. So we find that that is not happening but Yudhisthira Maharaj was ideal in all sense like that. And he was also given training by his uncle, uh, Dhritarashtra, who was also, in one sense, although he was blind, and he was uh, also knew the principles of how to rule, although he deviated in one sense by favoring his avaricious sons headed by Diodana over the Pandavas. And that was his downfall. Now, uh, so this is what we have from Maharaj Yudhisthira is an ideal king. In the Mahabharata, it also mentions that after Yudhisthira took the throne, he, um, he began a program where he allowed for each and any citizen within his uh, society and the world, actually, because he was the monarch of the world at that time, that they could come, and if they had a problem, or if they wanted to speak to the king, they could make an appointment, and then they would that appointment would allow them to come to see the king personally and speak their problem or um, whatever was their concern. So Yudhisthira Maharaj was just just like a spiritual master who allows his disciples and followers to come to meet him and discuss. So it wasn't that he was busy with so many things. That was also there. But uh, he, his main concern is the welfare of the public. We see that today in Krishna consciousness also. When the devotees are get, get everything they need to practice devotional service, they do wonderful service. They become fixed in their service. They contribute in a very meaningful way to the principles of preaching Krishna consciousness, they do wonderful service. If the devotees are not taken care of by the leadership and in our society, and they find some lack in whatever they need in order to keep the body and soul together, in order to perform devotional service, along with the training that they need as a disciple, then things, um, then we have so many problems. So uh, it's the duty of the leaders to be very aware of their followers and find out, see what they need 
just like there was an example, which is a small little example um, that Prabhupada gave when Prabhupada was in New Vrindavan. The, 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 the year was 1976. And Prabhupada had come to New Vrindavan, and the day was June 30th, I think that was the actual day. And uh, Prabhupada had an outside meeting with the devotees in one of the, one of the devotees' houses outside the house. And everyone gathered, and Prabhupada came, and he sat there, and he was speaking. As he began, he saw one of the disciples, one girl, and he could see that she was cold. It was a little cool that evening. And so um, Prabhupada immediately turned to the leader of the community, at that, who at that time was uh, Kuladri. He said, they won't say anything, but it's your duty to make sure that they have whatever they need. So Prabhupada was concerned that this one girl, her name was Gopalasa Priya. She uh, still remembers the incident, how Prabhupada turned his attention to her because she was feeling cold. She didn't say anything. And, but Prabhupada noticed that she needed a sweater or some kind of covering and he immediately made the point to the leader of the community. So this is how leadership should be, that they should see to the needs of those who they are uh, uh, guiding and uh, working in, uh, uh, working above and to make sure that they have everything they need. And it's the duty of those who follow to be very obedient to those who are leading. And Prabhupada made this short little aphorism. He said that the leaders should be very affectionate to the subordinates and the subordinates should be very obedient to leadership. He says, when that is there, then you have a successful society, you have a successful arrangement, government, um, sadhu sangha. So um, yeah, nowadays people are not trained in leadership. Sometimes people get leadership because they are very expert at knowing how to maneuver their way in such a way as they get the position in post. And then they always take that position in post to use it for some personal aggrandizement um, in one way or the other, but that's not leadership. Uh, so um, as we, again, going back to Srila Bhakti Tirta Swami, he was, he was a, uh, a revolutionary in establishing uh, what we call servant leadership, servant leadership, how one in a position of a leadership is not a leader in the true sense of the word, they are leading in the position of serving. In other words, they're the best of all servants because they have great responsibilities to lead by serving those who are working under their guidance. So that was very uh, much needed in our society. And I remember one particular government uh, personality from Michigan uh, was one of the first programs we had, we had in honor of Bhakti Tirta Maharaj's uh, disappearance. It was October 13th, I think October 16th or 13th, I think it was 16th, uh, 2005 in, uh, in uh, Detroit, in the temple, and one, uh, uh, what we say, local senator had come and he had read Maharaj's book on leadership. Uh, he was speaking and he was quite incredulous in the sense that he had never heard the term that a leader is a servant. But after he read and understood the point that Maharaj had been made, in, in describing what it means to be a leader, he uh, accepted it wholeheartedly and understood that this is the success of leadership, to be an ideal servant of those who are leading, not servant of the paycheck you get, or not servant of the glorifications you get for having such a position. These things are called perks. These things are extra. They come by way of some kind of 
responsibility and our necessity. The most important thing is the welfare of the persons you are leading. And so we have ideal kings in the history of uh, Vedic culture, Maharaj Yudhisthir, Maharaj Parikshit, um, uh, you know, Bart Maharaj, so many more, um, Parikshit Maharaj, oh, many, many made great kings who uh, established, not only did they lead successfully, but they established religious principles in their position of leadership. So um, this is very important, especially in today's world, where we have not only the opposite, we have this extreme opposite, where nobody even believes what the leaders are saying nowadays because they all lie. <laughs> they don't tell the truth because it's, if they were to tell the truth, they will be no longer in the position of leadership. <laughs> they will be removed. <laughs> Uh, one devotee said to Srila Prabhupada, because um, Prabhupada had for a while um, pushed this idea of Krishna consciousness president. We had started a party in the early days of Krishna consciousness, not in the very early days, but in the early days, which was in God we trust party where Prabhupada uh, inspired certain persons who had that acumen, that ability to leave and could understand a little bit about the political arrangements to take the position of running for president. And we ran one devotee for president. But after a while, Prabhupada stopped the whole thing. He thought it was useless uh, because he said, even if you get in there, you can't do anything because as soon as you get in there and you try to change things around for the benefit of people and then they either kill you or they re remove you in some way or another <clears throat> and this is the program because the leaderships in the governments are not the actual leaderships in society the governments are simply puppets for these big big industrialists who have multi-million dollar dollar projects and who control the governments through economic pressure and even military uh, military influence. So um, this is today's world. Therefore, welcome to Kali Yuga. First, we don't welcome anybody to this age. It's just what it is. Therefore, the only the only way. So we can somehow survive in this world, this particular society is to become very serious in chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. And then we are taking shelter of the perfect leader, Krishna himself. And Krishna will provide for the devotees who take shelter of him by chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra and engage in devotional service. And then we can accept Krishna as a supreme monarch as the uh, person who will provide everything we need in our life. Um, we don't depend on today's governments unless the governments actually show that they, which they cannot do, that they are responsible personalities. So um, yeah, this is Kali Yuga. And as the statement goes, Kali Yuga will continue to gravitate down where the, uh, we can't even imagine how bad it will be. And this is the age of Kali. But as it says, Kalir Doshani Gay Rajan Asti Eko Mahagun Kirtana Eva Krishnasya Mukta Sangam Param Vijet. And in this age, chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra is the bright light that will elevate persons above the influence of Kali Yuga and, and fix them under the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Sri Krishna. The problem with us is we don't, we follow numerical vows when we chant, we chant 16 rounds, that's nice. But that is not the actual in, injunctions from the scriptures. The injunctions from the scriptures is Satatam Kirtayan Tomam, always chant the holy names of the Lord constantly, 24 hours a day, 
or we might say as much as you can and consider uh, numerical vows to be a foundation for the, the bottom line. In other words, we should never go below our numerical vow, but we should always be chanting more and more and more. Okay, so I'll stop there and see if we got any comments or questions. <laughs> Thank you so much, Maharaj. It was such a wonderful class, Maharaj. It's an amazing topic, um, especially what's happening in today's world. This is such a, an amazing topic. We'd like to ask devotees if you have any questions, uh, please, uh, you know, comments or clarification, please uh, either do raise your hand or you can uh, jump right in. We have about 30 participants, so I'm going to do my best to. Um, answer the question, uh, monitor devotees wanting to ask questions. I'm going down the list here. My assistants are not well, so <laughs> it's just me, Maharaj. <laughs> oh, okay. Can we go to the gallery? And, yes, uh, Maharaj. I'm going to do that now. Uh, let me see. There. We, uh, of course, we, we hope that uh, they get well. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. <laughs> Pray that they get well, actually. Any questions from devotees? Any um, points? Any thoughts? Marge, um, actually, I have a question and um, actually three, but I'll ask one of them for now. In in the purport, your prophet was explaining how Maharaj Yudhisthira, um, being such a perfect leader, and um, how a leader um, is to help the citizens attain the highest stage of perfection. So as a servant leader, Maharaj, how can we help our communities, our congregation to attain, you know, the highest stage of perfection? What, how can we help them as servants? I think it starts by understanding our position, our, our responsibility as a leadership of, over us, the, the, the persons who we are leading and seeing what is the responsibility of that leadership, what are the duties that we have, learning how to fulfill those duties, but also in addition, as we mentioned, to see as we observe each and every person, we see what they can contribute and what they need in order to contribute. We ask persons sometimes to do services, but we also have to see what they need in order to do the service. So it's up to the leadership to provide the facilities and the resources when needed to inspire those who we are leading in their service and to monitor that also. In other words, to see as things go on, how they're making progress like that. So you might say that might be one, a lot for one person. Therefore, leadership requires a team. And there's different levels within the team. There's those who are on the top who are actually facilitating those underneath them who are also have different services that um, work with the people in general. So just like you see in the temples, you have a um, you have a temple president, then you may have a head pujari, you have a head cook, you have uh, something, someone who is responsible for the vehicles in this on the, in the temple, someone who is responsible for the accounting. So working with the leaders within the as a leader within and establishing another echelon of leadership to make sure that all of the different categories of activities are needed. And of course, we see there's one called devotee care, that's personal needs that devotees, whether the devotees need some a facility, some resources in order to do their service. There should, should be some kind of ministry or arrangement for that. The one I, that comes to my mind is that in our temples, uh, sometimes someone will find a need to change to Grihasta Ashram. So there is a need for connecting someone with uh, another person. So we call that the marriage counseling or marriage ministry. 
where that's there and then the bodies can put their names in and this is just an example of using this particular category where they can uh, find someone within the realm of krishna consciousness to develop a relationship and they'll eventually get married so we facilitate that also food programs, preaching programs, there should be someone in charge of the different categories that make up the temple responsibilities, the temple activities. So that, that uh, yeah, that has to be there. If you just have a leader and then you have followers, it's not going to work. <laughs> you have to have this middle echelon, which is more like a governing uh, not a governing, but a facilitator for all of the different needs broken up uh, into individuals who have that responsibility. Yeah. For instance, I'll give you an example. You have a kitchen, you have many, I mean, you say you maybe have three or four cooks, and then you have the head cook. What is the head cook? He doesn't do so much cooking, or she doesn't do so much cooking, because he makes sure everyone else has everything they need or on time are doing their service for cooking. And then the, the temple president or the leader will check with the head cook to make sure everything is going on. If the head cook needs something, then the temple president will provide that so they can provide for those. So it has to be, you know, like, and the principle is care and concern like that. Just like we also now we have what is called the mentorship system. So the spiritual master cannot be so much personally involved with each and every devotee, especially certain spiritual masters. They have so many devotees. Some of our spiritual masters have 30,000, 40,000 disciples. How are they gonna take care of all of these disciples? So a system has to be set up where there are responsible persons who are qualified, who are fixed in their spiritual life, who have the knowledge to be le leaders underneath the, the, uh, the spiritual master who can guide his disciples in their practice of Krishna consciousness and be and help to be accountable for those persons on um, both from their position and from the position of the disciples. Like that. So these systems have to be put in place. Depending on how big your temple facility is, your yatra is, and then to that extent, you need to set up this, this middle system of control and we say facilitation. Now that's just a succinct, very quick description how things could work in a more ideal way. Thank you, Mark. Like, I'm yeah, sorry. and like we like just recently we set up something with my disciples. But before then, I don't I I couldn't even respond to any questions like how is this disciple doing? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what she's doing or what he's doing, or how much they're actually progressing. What do they need to progress in Krishna consciousness? What are the struggles they're going through? So that, yeah, so we have to have some kind of, so that's the same in the temple. That's the same, you see, just like you see in the government, you have the government, you have the vice president, you have the secretary, you have the different ministers, you have cabinet members, you have the, the military, you have different aspects of a broader society which take care of different responsibilities. Thank you, Maharaj, thank you so much. That really helped. We started a similar program at our temple, being the size of it being small. Um, uh, we called it uh, we, we called Bhakti Engagement Group, where we have few devotees who really wanted, um, who's very much keen into wanting to progress in Krishna consciousness, and we had to create a um, we created a spiritual mentorship program just recently, a few weeks ago, yeah. a few months ago, yeah. Good. Yeah, that's good. That's needed. It's needed wherever there is organization, there has to be echelon like that. Thank you, Maharaj. Raj Prabhu, please go ahead. Thank you. 
Hare Krishna, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to yourself, Maharaj. All glories to all devotees present. Raj, during your uh, during your nice class, you, you mentioned that if people are following other religions, then they should practice those religions properly. But it seems to me it's hard to say what properly means because in all the world's major religions, there are so many different groups that have disagreements and disputes with each other. Well, that's Kali Yuga. Another feature of Kali Yuga, no one can agree with anybody. Uh, but this is a statement from Prabhupada, and I'm, and I'm just repeating that. He says it's the duty of the government to make sure that each and every individual within the state is following the religion of their choice, according to the principles of that room. So he gives a general statement. Now, how to do that in a practical way, you would have to have some kind of ministry to set up to both investigate and uh, see, you know, what is the ideal, uh, uh, what does the scripture say according to a particular tradition? And the people are following, and the leaders in that tradition also are following that. So yeah, we find that this is the, uh, it's not that the religious sector is independent, but they're getting what they need through a, a leader who is qualified to uh, organize things so people follow nicely. So the state is called Rajarsi. Rajarsi means Raja Rishi. Raja Rishi means a king who is saintly or who, who governs by saintly principles. So we might say king is in the category of Kshatriya. So that's Raja. And Rishi means those who are saintly, the Ruminical order. So uh, in order for society to be ideal according to a progressive, which means ideal. Uh, it's mentioned in the Srimad Bhagavatam, three things make up an ideal society. One, Brahminical culture, a class of leaders who are versed in the scriptures, who live according to the scriptures, who can teach the scriptures and who guide the society leaders, such as the Kshatriyas, in uh, religious principles, spiritual knowledge. Two, you have to have what is called, um, let's see, there is, uh, there has to be protection of cows. Cow protection, agriculture, all of these are a very integral part of because people need food, animals require protection, and society needs these, this facility in order to support their principles of governing. So cows have to be protected, women have to be protected, um, um, children have to be protected, Brahmins have to be protected. Uh, what is the, uh, the last one? And old people must require protection and whatever they need to live. So, uh, yeah, that's also part provided by the government, these five categories of protection. It says that if a government doesn't neglect any one of them, especially the Brahmins or the cows, the whole society will gravitate down. And that's what you have today. Uh, and the third one is God consciousness. So society means for medical culture, cow protection, God consciousness. And there's a very lengthy explanation of these three principles in the first canto, in the later part of the first canto, chapter 17, chapter 18. You can read the details that Prabhupada gets into really uh, quite uh, thoroughly describing these three and how they correlate together as a perfect society. So where do you find any of those three today? 
<laughs> you know, then there's this idea that, you know, Vedic culture was a culture that was good many years ago, but now we have this modern society. And therefore, these things are what, would, what does they say, old fashioned, out of date, no longer applicable. No, these are, these are given by God, given through scripture, given through saintly persons as the ideal way to live in society. They are not old fashioned, they're not antiquated, they're not outdated. No. But the whole idea in today's society is, get, is governed towards economic development and sense gratification. This is the goal of every particular country in the world. Sense gratification, economic development. That These two things are not the goal of life. It's simply a feature, these two things, the needs of the senses and the artha, artha and kama, follow dharma. They are not independent of dharma. Dharma, artha, karma, moksha. The four purusharthas or activities of human society. But they've thrown out dharma, they've thrown out moksha, and, and then it's all about artha and kama, that's all. Therefore, you have an animal society. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Yeah. So religion is the constitutional principle of each and every living entity to worship God. Um, therefore, that that facility should be given to the to its maximum amount. Everyone should have the maximum amount of facility in order to execute their religious principles. And that's the duty of the government to see that it that that goes on. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, Namrata Mataji, you have a question, please. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Shri Prabhupada. Yes, today I have a question which was uh, frequently asked by many of the relatives or friends to me. Uh, and I, I seek forg forgiveness if there is any offense in this question, but uh, they were asking about the, the attack of Bangladesh, which is uh, the Bangladesh te uh, ISKCON temple is attacked twice. So uh, why is ISKCON uh, not under the process of making a Kshatriya community like they have uh, uh, started the projects of GEV, which is uh, GEV New Rajavrindavan? and um, Krishna Valley and all, which is the ideal projects as a Vaishya community. So uh, uh, this was the question from there, that why of, is, is, is Khan taking any steps towards, Shatri, to, towards making an ideal Kshatriya community? No, they're not, but individuals within ISKCON are doing something no, that's as much as we have. It's not been it's not been given priority by the leadership in the in the society, and that's unfortunate because it's part of Shila Prabhupada's instructions. He says that um, we should establish Vanashram Dharma. Vanashram Dharma means to engage people according to their propensity in devotional service. And so you have the Brahmins, you have the Kshatriyas, you have the Vaishyas. So each should be, all persons who have those tendencies and proclivities should be given education to work according to their capacity and trained first and then work according to their capacity. That's part of Vanashram Dharma and that's also part of Srila Prabhupada's instructions if you listen to Srila Prabhupada's statements and you read his his uh, books especially in the first canto he speaks about the kshatriyas have uh, three duties it's called uh, <clears throat> what is it 
Uh, protection. Um, organization, protection, and welfare. We give it a, an anachronism. It's called POW, P-O-W. So these, these are the three areas that the Kshatriyas or the leaders in society have, that they are all three. Now we have a class of devotees in our society who are well-trained in fighting. Uh, personally, I got involved in trying to establish Kshatriya Dharma in our society in the year 2013. And we were moving in the direction which was very good. Unfortunately, things got a little topsy-turvy. There was some dissension and there was no support from the society and things started to break down. Fortunately, we did get in area, certain areas, we established protection in a few of the temples around the world, but not more than that. Um, so, uh, yeah. Because um, this is the way Kali Yuga is, the, you know, at any time we can get attacked and you see that happens on the death more than two times. It's happened more than two times, not just two times. Two times is in within the recent, within, within the last year, but it's happened much more than that. So, yeah, I've known devotees. I know many temples that have been attacked, devotees have been killed. Um, so it's been going on. Uh, so we need that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's part of Vanashram Dharma, it's part of Prabhupada's instructions, and obviously it's needed in order to protect the devotees, the deities, the temple, and the properties of the temple. All of that requires protection because it all belongs to Krishna and it's meant for devotional service. And you're living at Kali Yuga. And therefore, you're going to see that these things will happen and they'll continue to happen. Not only from a certain sector of society, but it can happen from, from other sectors of society also. Yeah, so yeah, my, I, I also share your concern, a concern of that person who questioned you. We need to put more priority in establishing Kshatriya Dharma. And believe it or not, it's happening on the sides with smaller groups of devotees who are working in an area and they're making it their priority. I can't get into too much of the details of what's going on, but it's happening as a parallel thing to our society. But if the society itself understands and gives its support, then it will be established throughout the society. And that's what we really need. Mm -hmm. So Maharaj, uh, the devotees who understand this aspect of Kshatriya Dharma, uh, how can we tell them, uh, like, if there, uh, there is a next generation coming up who, who, who are yeah, like the devotee, uh, the children of devotee families, how can we train them uh, according to uh, Kshatriya Dharma? Like well, we give them a beautiful education, like we tell them how to be a Grihastha. How can we teach them uh, a Kshatriya Dharma as well? Well, it says it's the duty of the leadership to evaluate and see who has then those proclivities and tendencies and then train accordingly. It's not everyone should be trained as Kshatriyas or everyone is trained as Brahmanas. Just like one of the devotees who I was working with, who was involved with martial arts and, and training, he said for years they were trying to train me as a Brahmana. And then I just realized I wasn't a Brahmana. <laughs> and then he excelled when he understood that his tendency was more in the area of organization and protection. So he became quite qualified in that area. So that's in, in the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, Srila Prabhupada writes, it's the duty, and he writes it very strongly, it's the duty the spiritual master to observe his disciples and see how to engage them in devotional service. 
So we're not doing that. The leadership's not doing that. I was not doing it enough. And therefore, Vanashram College. So we have one devotee in our society who is establishing a Vanashram College right now and is developing. And um, it's going to take about a year before it gets established as a working college. We're, we're getting the land, we're getting the buildings done. That project is going on right now. So, but Prabhupada's program was Van Ashram College in many places. But if you listen to Prabhupada's lecture, March 14th, 1974, also on March 1974, morning walk conversation in Vrindavan, Prabhupada outlines the whole idea of Van Ashram, Van Ashram establishing a Van Ashram College how it should be run, who should be the teachers, how the subject matter should be organized. He gets into it in very great detail. Uh, that's a very, it, it's a very long lecture. It's not a lecture, it's a morning walk conversation with some of his leaders, they discuss that. The problem is we don't listen to Prabhupada's lectures <laughs> and we don't know what's going on. <laughs> We think, you know, maybe we read the books once in a while. We don't need to read his lectures. His lectures, he gives a lot of instructions, a lot of uh, directions to our society. Everything Prabhupada said is relevant. It's not like something is important and something is not. And he tells us what is most important. And engaging devotees according to their propensities, their nature will make a, a qualitative difference in the type of religious society we have. <laughs> like I know one temple, I won't mention it, <laughs> where the Pajaris, you know, they're Pajaris, so Pajari work is, is Brahminical work, but the Pajaris are Kshatriyas, they have that Kshatriya nature. And so they always fight about you know, who should do the service and how the service should go on. <laughs> so you can't put Kshatriyas together. They just don't. <laughs> they have to have their little independent area to work with and to rule over. That's how Kshatriyas are. Brahma Brahmins can work together like that. Vaishyas can work together. Kshatriyas can work in cooperation with others, but they still have to have absolute control. That's a Kshatriya. So you must be a Kshatriya because you are a temple president. <laughs> so the, yeah, that's what it that's what it takes. So this Vanashram is not, you know, it's not something new. It's 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 Krishna's Krishna's arrangement. Vanashram Acharyata. You know. Jatarvana Tama Srishta Guna Karma Vibhagas Yaha. Krishna says, I set up this system. There are four kinds of people. They're the Brahminical inclined, the, the organizational inclined, the, those who are farmers, agriculturists, businessmen, they're inclined, and then the supporting factors are the sutras and workers. These four types of people make up, make up a complete society. And when people are engaged accordingly and engaged in devotional service, then you have fast and very quick results. So that's still, as Prabhupada said, 50% of my mission is still undone. What was that? Van Ashram, he said it. Daivi Van Ashram, we have to clarify, it's not just Van Ashram, it's Daivi Van Ashram. Spiritual Van Ashram. So it's something that we should take seriously and preach about it and talk about it and inspire others to get involved in working in that way. If we wait for the leadership and in a general sense, to, to take to take a stance and do it, it may not, it may never happen, unfortunately. So we have to do it within our own areas. That's all.
So Maharaj, we have to recognize our own uh, self, our own skills, and uh, you know maybe talk to our mentors or spiritual master and work in that direction. Yeah, get guidance, suggestions. And also, if there's training needed, that can be, that should be available. Okay. Thank you, Maharaj. Yeah, we all know intuitively when we work according to our nature, we are happy and we contribute in a very wonderful way. I think I have something uh, to answer them, Maharaj. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Vrindavan Nath Prabhu. Thank you, Mataji. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. <clears throat> uh, Guru Maharaj, like my uh, point is that this is considered to be golden age of Kali Yuga, while uh, atmosphere is already changing from bad to worse, like epidemic, then natural crisis and others. But I observed one thing, uh, natural, like personally, that uh, my spiritual sadhana has got more stronger uh, than it was before in this crisis. Although it's not good, like at human level, like what's going on, people are suffering. But because of like, whether working from home or other regions in last few years, really, really much stronger. And I was thinking in normal situations, we are always hankering for some material opulences. <laughs> so <laughs> are these material crises and difficulties happening in our lives? So Krish because Krishna wants us to be more and more serious, more focused towards him, that normally we will not really take our path towards him. But in this not, kind of crisis. No, not really. Crisis means material existence. It's just material existence is a crisis. <laughs> if, it, if people don't live by religious principles, it gets worse and worse and worse. Krishna puts the three modes of material nature into, into effect, and the modes work accordingly. He has nothing to do with the modes. He wants each and every one of us to be Krishna conscious. But... He gives us our independence. So people choose to be sinful, things go down, and even good people are affected by that. So you are just one of, I would say, many, many who um, have grown in this, uh, what we say, apparent crisis. But the crisis is an ongoing thing. It's not, sometimes, as Prabhupada said, the material world is always bad. And sometimes it's not as bad, but it's always bad. <laughs> so what is happening now, and I can uh, try to illustrate, is that these, these, these horrors that are going on around the world are ushering in Lord Chaitanya's movement. Mm. Uh, before, things, before the sun comes up, things get darker and darker. There's an old saying, the darkest hour is just before dawn. So Lord Chaitanya's movement will rise up, but it's up to uh, the devotees to make it happen. And, but Lord Chaitanya will empower anyone who is willing to take the responsibility to preach Krishna consciousness and to live according to the principles of you know, Sanatana Dharma. So the Lord allows whatever goes on because he doesn't interfere with the three modes of material nature, but he gives protection and direction to the devotees. People are sinful, demons are in, the, in control. If people are pious, the demigods are in control. If people are very sinful and very degraded, then the yakshas and the rakshashas are in control. So right now the demons are in control. Just read Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 7, chapter 1, verse number 8, which explains everything clearly. 
And ultimately, when people are sinful, everything goes down. The earth withholds her gifts of nature. Uh, crime increases, violence increases, dissension increases, so many things. And the biggest sin in the world is cow killing. And that is causing so many calamities. As it says that the mother cow, and the cow is our mother, and therefore, and that's not some kind of a euphemism, just to, and the cow is that we're, we're actually killing our mother and we expect to be happy in the world. Systematic slaughter of thousands and thousands of cows worldwide every day, hundreds of thousands worldwide. It's producing heavy karma on the society. And Prabhupada says, then you have to send your children into the war fields to be slaughtered, just like the cows are being sent to the slaughterhouse to be slaughtered. Same thing. <laughs> There's no difference. This is the law of nature. This is the law of God. <laughs> you know, this cow killing, systematic cow killing, has caused tremendous suffering upon the human society. And will continue to do so unless it's uh, unless it's curtailed. That's why another part of Prabhupada's movement is cow protection, farm communities, agriculture, simple living. My god sister, uh, I gave one class. I gave two classes just a couple of weeks ago. About um, she wrote a book. It's called Bhakti Milk. And it'll be published in, in the form of a dis distributed book soon. How by buying in to commercial dairies, we're actually supporting cow slaughter. By taking milk from commercial outlets, because these commercial outlets, they have agreements with slaughterhouses that when the cow gets old, not uh, gets old, when the cow no longer can produce milk, they send the cow to the slaughterhouse. So, yeah, so the book is available. It's done. It's not fully correlated in print yet, but it's also a statement by the GBC that by the year 2022, this year, John Mastami, each and every, each and every temple must have, this is a GBC resolution, must have a program for providing milk and milk products for the deities from our own society, our own farms, not from outside. Otherwise, we're supporting, not the indirectly, but directly cow slaughter by buying and using milk products from commercial dairies. And if you want more information, just listen to my classes. I gave two classes, I think a couple of weeks ago. The devotees remember those classes. We covered that in detail. Um, and then anyone who wants a copy of the book, I have it um, on my computer, and I'd be happy to send it to you. I think I send it to Srimati to, to distribute it to anyone who uh, asks. Me. If there's anyone out, out there who would like it, I can also send it to Anasuya. And it's a very important book. When you read it, Deva Amrita Swami has written a very significant article which supports this whole, whole thing uh, de debunking and defeating any other uh, argument supporting the use of commercial milk so uh, so what i'm going back to is your original question yes it's getting very dark out there and a lot of it is due to killing of the systematic killing of cows. Wars, pestilence, disease, all of these are results of animal slaughter. <laughs> because Krishna loves each and every living entity equally. He doesn't favor one living entity over another because he's a hum pita, a hum bija. He is the seed-giving father of all life. So if we abuse 
any living entity unnecessarily for our own selfish sense gratification, we are committing great sinful activities. It's an offense against the Supreme Lord directly. Mm -hmm. Along with being offense against that living entity. Mm -hmm. And we can go into other areas that are very sinful. So yeah, so you will see, and don't be surprised that things will get darker and darker, but eventually, Lord Chaitanya has a plan to bring in the golden age. And each and every one of us has some responsibility to help contribute to that golden age by preaching Krishna consciousness, by uh, living according to spiritual values, spiritual principles. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you very much. And thank you for correcting me that this is not Krishna, this is his three modes. And uh, I just mentioned like 7.1.8. Uh, in the last line, Srila Prabhupada has also mentioned that this is not the partiality of Supreme Lord. So, thank you. Yeah, very much. yeah that chapter is called the, the, the Supreme Personality of Godhead is equal to everyone. And he's all good. <laughs> Thank you, Guru Maharaj. And just like uh, your milk related, uh, uh, that uh, two classes, Guru Maharaj, 22nd and 23rd Feb, anybody would like to, uh, it's all available in Guru Maharaj, uh, Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud. So it's all there. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Prabhupada. A very nice question. Before we go to Sri Devi's question, Maharaj, um, Anasu, you asked, uh, where is the Vedic, the Vanasham College being set up? And she, she asked a question in the chat. In Mayapur. Okay. Thank you, Maharaj. Sri Devi Mataji, please go with your question. Thank you, Anasuya. Please accept my humble obeisance, Guru Maharaj. All glory to Srila Prabhupada. Guru Maharaj, thank you for this really great class. You're just hanging on to every word that you're speaking because this is our future. What you're speaking is going to determine our future, how seriously we take the instructions that are being given now and which are in Prabhupada's books. I'm so thankful. Thank you very much. That's one thing. My second, actually my question is Guru Maharaj, and please, I'm, I'm not asking this <clears throat> to offend or to annoy anyone. I'm just asking for my own, um, you know, clarification. It is very obvious that in many, many temples, we have leadership that is less than ideal. Let me put it that way. Is it that we are going through a phase of keeping troubles and, you know, this is a learning phase. We are a very new organization. We are just getting our act together. Even the caliber of people who are coming to Krishna consciousness, Srila Prabhupada said, the children of your children will be the real devotees. So maybe it is us, you know, we are not so qualified, being very fallen. And what happens is that people get traumatized, people get put off, people sometimes leave. I mean, all kinds of things we have gone through and all the scandals that have taken place, et cetera, et cetera. So should we just take it as this is, you know, a learning curve and we are learning lessons and we are going to get better and a different caliber of people is getting trained so that we have better leaders for the future or we are just going to fumble and bumble along and, you know, catch plump person running down the corridor and say, you're it now, you're the temple president. And then after that, he is, you know, flying by the seat of his pants, literally. And, you know, everybody just gets fried and then you just put up a stiff upper lip and say, okay, okay, I'll do the best I can. And we just, you know, carry on saying, okay, Chan Hare Krishna Prabhu and everything will be okay. Every, every service requires uh, training and education. And 
you train those who are qualified and then you give them education also. So evaluating, training, education. Evaluation comes first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, emergence, just like people say, well, um, I want second initiation because uh, the temple requires a pajari. Now, does that mean you're qualified just because the temple requires a pajari and you've been maybe first initiated for a couple of years? No, you require some uh, qualifications and then training also. Yeah, so training has to be there. And training means education, just like when we talk, go back to Kshatriya Dharma. Kshatriya Dharma doesn't simply mean uh, one aspect of it is the martial aspect. So there are devotees who, I, who know martial arts quite good and they're really good fighters. I know many like that, but they also have to know what is the Shastric principles that make up that, that, that particular Dharma or that particular Varna. If they're just trained in the military side and they don't know the philosophical side, the educational side, then it might turn into something that is quite ugly. So you have to know what it means to practice a particular service in a particular way. So training has to be there. That's why Prabhupada said, Van Ashram College. It goes back to that again. I mean, Prabhupada said that in 1974. What year is it now? Two more years will be 50 years later. <laughs> So something has happened, obviously, but we put emphasis in certain areas and de-emphasize other areas. But um, then if you de-emphasize some of the important areas, which means devotee training and devotee education, then the quality of our society is simply going to be just like, uh, just like any other religion. You go and you... You go and you do your prayers and you, you perform some of the rituals, you chant some rounds, you eat some prasadam and you sit at the table discussing what's going on for the next two hours. Nothing. <laughs> like I'm here in GEV. So I was asking one brahmachari today, how many brahmacharis are here? So he said there's 60 brahmacharis. So, and that's a small number right now because of the situation. So each of those 60 brahmacharis has a particular service and they work according to that service. And they're, they're, some of them are training as they perform the service and others uh, are already trained in doing the service. So that covers all areas of the activities of the community. No area is left out. And then there's management on an overall level. And then, so all of that has to be there. Yeah. So we go back to the same, pretty much the question that Raj brought up. You know, we have to have... Uh, Education, evaluation, education, and training. When Prabhupada started the movement by, he knew he didn't have much time. So he allowed people to do different services and he gave people services that they were not qualified to do because it was emergency. But that was in the initial stages. That was not Prabhupada's overall program. It was just the need at the time. But well, we somehow or other haven't evolved out of that thing. We see, oh, here's a, here's a free devotee and here's a service that needs to be done. Mm 
And sometimes so it goes up, and sometimes it goes on, and sometimes it doesn't. But when, when one is trained and educated, then, I mean, Prabhupada's statement on Vanashram College is so direct and so clear and so outlined. He outlined it in a few, he explained it again in February 14th, 1977, in a room conversation with Hari Sari Prabhu and Satcharup Maharaj. You can get that conversation. It was in Mayapur. In Mayapur, February 14th, 1977, room conversation with and again, Prabhupada emphasized that's just a few months before he departed. So Guru Maharaj, again, I'm I'm just asking this because I want to know for my own self. I'm not asking this to stir the pot or to create controversy or anything of the sort. I'm asking because isn't there now an urgent need for us to get our act together and not carry on the dysfunctional patterns of the past, but actually put people in place with training and education so that we don't mess up anymore? Yeah, well, it's happening in some places. It's actually being done. So it's not like what our society runs, not as a uniform society, but individual yatras, temples, are really meant to do it in their local areas. So those who are leaders and the GBC representatives should be initiating these different programs. Hmm. It's like we tried to do, we tried to do something in Slovenia. And it's, it's going on, but then again, we're getting resistance from some of the, some of, some of the people who are involved, who are leaders in the present it's, uh, society. So we have to work out that those resistance because you see there's vested interests. We've established a lot of vested interests within the society and the people, in order for these programs to really to develop, we have to move away from vested interest and see the overall interest. Mm. Mm. So it's not so easy. Once you establish something in the wrong way, it's it's harder to reestablish the right way. Right, exactly. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Thank you very much. Please give us your blessings so we at least, your disciples, can try to do our very best to follow your instructions and follow Srila Prabhupada's directions. Yeah, keep strong sadhana. That will be the foundation for anything else you do. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Thank you so much. Your blessings are earnestly solicited. Thank you for a nice question too, Sri Devi Mataji. And thank you, Maharaj, for such a wonderful answer. Um, Maharaj, it's nine, almost 9.30 a.m., 9.25 a.m. here. I don't know if you would, I don't know what time it's in India, if you would like to turn around or would you like to well, end we got it? Seven minutes to seven in the evening. Oh, okay, then we are good. I'm not good with this time thing, Marge. Please forgive me, Marge. It's still in. <laughs> I'm very slow in that department. <laughs> Marge, would you, um, actually, before we end, if there are any other questions from devotees, any other comments? Um, Clarification, uh, please uh, do jump right in, raise your hand if you have any questions, any comments, <clears throat> and um, just going down the list so that I don't forget anyone. If there isn't, Maharaj, since there isn't, would you like to chant around, Maharaj? Yeah, we can. Yes. Haribo.